In late February 2018, 16-month-old Eli was a happy and healthy young boy. However, on a seemingly normal Monday, he began to experience some discomfort that was initially thought to be a probable urinary tract infection. As the week progressed, he grew sicker. And on the Thursday, while changing Eli's nappy, his mother discovered a lump the size of her fist in his abdomen and immediately rushed him to the emergency department. After a series of examinations that included two ultrasounds, it became clear that a tumour was affecting Eli's bladder. And by 7 p.m. that night, he'd been transferred to a local children's hospital. The following day, Eli underwent a biopsy of his tumour. And on the Sunday, his mother was given the news of a malignant cancer diagnosis. Commencing 501 days of chemotherapy treatment the very next morning, Eli and his loved ones were thrust into a challenging and an unimaginable reality. In this harrowing circumstance, the entire world changes, not just for Eli, but for all of those around him. Childhood cancer is a devastating diagnosis, affecting one in 6,000 children under the age of 15. While it's considered to be relatively rare, accounting for 1% of all cancer diagnoses, it's the second leading cause of death in children, only behind accidents, and is the leading cause of death from disease. The World Health Organization estimates that more than 400,000 children are diagnosed with cancer each year around the world. In Australia, 1,000 children and teenagers are diagnosed each year in our paediatric institutions. Over the last 60 years, survival rates for childhood cancer have improved from less than 20% to greater than 80%. This is really due to the introduction of chemotherapy and radiotherapy treatments. This glass is half full perspective on improvements in childhood cancer is often emphasized, particularly for acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is the most common childhood cancer, in which survival rates have risen from less than 10% in the 1960s to now about 95%. However, there are still unbalanced outcomes in survival and we are far from reaching 100%, which is what we must aim for. Every week in Australia, three children die from cancer. And for many cancer types, the treatments have remained unchanged for decades. And so survival rates have stagnated. In addition to these statistics, there is an alarming rate of late effects for childhood cancer survivors. 70% of children who survive their cancer suffer long-term effects of their treatment. This can include developmental delay, kidney and heart damage, hearing loss, infertility, psychosocial problems, and a higher incidence of de developing a second cancer in later life. This really highlights the urgent need for new and improved therapies that are, that are not only more effective, but also less toxic, thereby improving patient survival as well as survivor quality of life. We are learning more and more about childhood cancer. We now know that childhood cancers, even of the same diagnoses, can be separated into different groups based on very distinct genetic and molecular information, each with different underlying causes, different responses to therapy, and different prognoses. No one child's cancer is the same as another. And so we need to move away from these one size fits all treatments and instead identify and implement specific treatments for individual patients that are more effective and spare patients ineffective therapies and the treatments that come with them. But how do we determine the right treatment for the right patient? Can we just learn from breakthrough personalized therapies in adult cancers that are more common? No, we can't because children are not simply small adults. We know that childhood cancers are biologically distinct from adult cancers, even those that occur in the same tissues. And so it's no surprise that cancer therapies that are designed for adults have been largely ineffective in children. In fact, in the last 40 years, only 12 new drugs have been approved for the treatment of childhood cancer, whereas more than 500 have been approved for adults. 
critical in identifying new treatments and understanding which patients will respond and which will not is a greater understanding of individual childhood cancers. One way to do this is through the study of patient tumour tissue and the development of patient tumour tissue derived models in the laboratory. What we do with patient tumour tissues is incredibly important. Traditionally, tissues collected at surgery are fixed in preservative or frozen, enabling long-term storage, but really limiting the types of downstream analyses that can be performed on them. As these tissues are utilised for further testing or research, they become smaller and smaller and are eventually completely exhausted, gone for all future studies. Nowadays, every attempt is also made to generate a living patient tumour tissue derived model in the laboratory that can be indefinitely grown and expanded, providing a renewable resource for research. These models can then be shipped all over the world to other researchers to further facilitate and accelerate collaborative research discoveries. Advances in technology, particularly in the last 10 to 15 years, are now enabling researchers to map the genetic, molecular and functional landscapes of childhood cancer. The reason for this is that one, new technologies have emerged and two, the cost of using these technologies is decreasing as efficiency increases. For example, the cost to sequence an entire human genome for a single patient in 2001 was estimated to be $100 million. 15 years later, in 2016, it cost $4,000. And nowadays, it can be done for less than $1,000. This is now enabling researchers to map all of the genetic mutations in an individual patient tumor to identify those mutations that drive the disease and can potentially be treated with existing drugs. So in theory, if a patient has a mutation in gene A, they could be treated with drug A because that drug is known to counteract the effects of that mutation. However, in reality, it's not that simple. Only about 40% of patients have mutations that we can currently treat with a known drug. And of those, only about 10% will actually go on to receive that treatment. Secondly, not all patients with targetable mutations will actually respond to that specific drug. And so nowadays, other types of tumor molecular analyses are also performed to complement tumor genomics, each informing on different characteristics of the tumor as well as potential therapies. Additionally, patient tumor tissue derived models in the laboratory can be exploited for functional studies that directly implicate the pathways that drive the growth of the cancer, as well as the effects of different drug treatments. Robotic assisted high throughput drug screening can test hundreds to thousands of different drugs in living patient cells in the laboratory in real time to determine which drugs work and which drugs do not. New genetic screening technologies like CRISPR, which is a pair of molecular scissors that can cut DNA, enables researchers to interrogate individual gene functions in living patient tumor cells to determine which genes and pathways the tumor cells actually rely on for their survival. This can be done at different scales, including interrogating every single gene in the human genome in a single laboratory experiment. All of this genetic, molecular and functional information is incredibly powerful, but it generates mountains and mountains of data. How do we make sense of it? How can we harness that data to identify the right target, the right drug or the right drug combinations for the right patient? The answer is embracing innovative machine learning or artificial intelligence technologies that have the ability to process all this data, integrate it all together, and provide informed predictions. Machine learning is currently being used by researchers to integrate genetic, molecular, and functional information on specific childhood cancer cell types and tumor types in response to therapy. This is allowing drug responses to be directly linked to specific genetic and molecular signatures of the tumor cells, identifying 
predictive biomarkers of response. These biomarkers then allow us to identify patients that are most likely to respond to specific therapies. And conversely, also identify patients that are unlikely to respond or, may, or who may experience toxicity and therefore that treatment should be avoided. While these studies are mostly limited to the lab at the moment and need to be tested in clinical trials, it's hoped that these outcomes will ultimately be applied to patients. Machine learning is also being used in Australia and around the world to classify childhood brain tumours. This is providing important prognostic information for the clinicians as well as the patients and families, and in some cases is actually resulting in a change in the patient's treatment. It's expected that this same technology will also be relevant for other childhood cancers. But can we rely on artificial intelligence to direct patient clinical care? The accuracy of artificial intelligence is dependent on the amount and the quality of input data. Machine learning algorithms need to be appropriately trained using well-defined data sets. They must also be able to adapt or evolve as their data repositories continue to grow with time. The more data, the greater the accuracy. This poses a challenge in childhood oncology since childhood cancers are rare. And so national and international collaborations are necessary to contribute patient tumour tissues and patient tumour tissue derived models that represent all of the different childhood cancer types as well as the variation within each type. This is something that the global childhood cancer community is embracing with open arms. Ultimately though, artificial intelligence predictions and recommendations do require careful human consideration, taking into account not only tumour biology but also individual patient circumstances. Where does the patient live and will they have access to the drug? What is the drug cost? Will the drug interact with the patient's existing medications? What is the health of the patient and their comorbidities and will they tolerate the drug? Growing numbers of patient tumour tissues and models derived from them will undoubtedly help strengthen and refine artificial intelligence predictions and recommendations leading to more effective therapies with fewer side effects for individual patients. However, this will not be achieved by brain or artificial intelligence brawn alone, but rather in a momentous coming together of the health and the technological fields, brain and AI brawn together. It is a partnership in which both are reliant on each other to generate and process large data sets derived from patient tissues and models leading to novel discoveries that include new drug treatments, biomarkers of predictive drug response, and optimal clinical management strategies. The childhood cancer research community continues to embrace and utilize innovative technologies, including artificial intelligence, that is greatly enhancing our understanding of childhood cancers, leading to, to a united goal of improving patient survival and patient survivorship. It is an exciting time to be working for the children of today, who we of course want to be the adults of the future.